it's uh, only streaming. There is no uh, video, uh, video conference with someone else. Uh. It's yeah, it's it's both because some of the speakers are joining virtually, like this morning, and yeah, and but they should also see us and the speakers here. Okay, it's in video, but, yeah. they, they but they know it. They're all set up. They just have to press. Yeah. Should I walk upstairs and explain it? But they should be. Okay, but they should be there around now. We have tested it this morning, it should be fine. Let me just uh, make sure that they. Uh, I think they should be because they know it. Uh <coughs> yeah, that's correct. And then the other one will probably join very soon. But they realize that. First, there will be a speaker here, and they should also be see the, the, the yes. future people should be seeing her as well, and, yeah. and me and Sebastian. Okay. okay. So if they can give me a signal when they start the stream, then I can just start the, the session. Okay. Because I don't know when, when we're live or not. You know, like, uh, we're we're live. Good afternoon. Are we live? Oh no, but it's okay. It's it's a bit too early for the. We have different parts in the program right now. Huh? We start with the keynote, and she will come after. So it's not the purpose to have the the video stream right now. I'm sorry. So we can just go back to the presentation, please. We have practiced and <laughs> yeah, perfect. And can we also see the presentation here, please? Fantastic. All right, it seems that we're now um, up and running. Yeah, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Geert Asselbergs. I am the coordinator of the EU STEM coalition. And I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you here and uh, also everyone who has joined us online, which hopefully everyone can see us now, at this uh, General Assembly of the EU STEM Coalition coming to you from the Palais de Congrès here in San Rafael, France. Uh, the General Assembly is our annual conference in which we discuss the latest developments in, uh, in, in the area of STEM education and the labor market, as well as the success stories that we see on the national and the regional level. In today's program, we will start with a keynote speech to highlight the urgency of uh, the STEM skills shortages from the perspective of industry. And this urgency was, of course, uh, further increased by all the recent developments that we have seen, uh, like, uh, like the energy transition, which was made worse by the situation in Ukraine, labor shortages, the aftermath of COVID, climate change, and so on, uh, which will all require high-tech STEM-driven solutions. With that in mind, we will then move on to three presentations. Uh, the first presentation will focus on the findings of an important study by the European Education and Culture Executive Agency on increasing achievement and motivation in mathematics and science learning in schools. So we will learn a bit more about the, the main findings in that study. Then we will take a step back from the European context and uh, take a look at the United States and specifically the recent actions that were taken there in response to the chip shortages. Finally, we will hear about a big new initiative of the European Commission and EIT that was just launched earlier this week, uh, which aims to address all these challenges, which is called the Deep Tech Talents Initiative. And uh, our colleagues from the EIT will talk a bit more about that. Now, before I introduce our first keynote speaker, I would like to say a big thank you to our French partner organization, UPSTI, for hosting us 
here in this beautiful location in, uh, in San Rafael and give the word to Mr. Sebastian Gagajay for a brief word of welcome. And he's the director of UPSTI. Dear Mrs. Francois Chambard, these dear Agville Schulmeister, dear Mr. James Brown, dear Mr. Martin Kern, dear guests, dear colleagues, dear friends, welcome to San Rafael. My name is Sébastien Jargadier. I'm the president of this association, UPSTI, which co organized this event, uh, and my colleagues. Pierre-Louis Chiambaretto, uh, who is the uh, general, uh, general Secretary of this association. It's a pleasure to welcome you uh, for your General Assembly. The program of this afternoon is very, very interested, and we are sorry to not stay with us. We apologize for our absence during this first part of General Assembly this afternoon. In fact, we will spend this time with primary classes, 120 children, to raise their awareness of science and technology through practical activities in the STEM approach. During your break, you can take a look um, of what is going on with these children. After the, your break, this break, we will have the opportunity to introduce you to our association. With Pierre Louis, we wish you a very good General Assembly. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Gagajay. Uh, with that said, I would like to give a warm welcome to our first keynote speaker of today, uh, Mrs. Françoise Chambard, who is the chairwoman and co-founder of Melexis, and also the chairwoman of the Flemish STEM platform in Belgium. Welcome, Mr. Mrs. Chambard. Thank you, Geert. And good afternoon to all of you um, here in, uh, uh, in San Rafael, and also all the people uh, who are following uh, online. Now, um, what I'll try to do, and uh, here it already introduced that uh, very well, uh, that indeed there is a sense of urgency. Uh, and I'd like to demonstrate with, uh, the, um, uh, with the presentation that strong STEM talent is quintessential to have a strong economy. Uh, and we all know that a strong economy is crucial and is vital in order to um, be resilient. It's the backbone of our resilience. Uh, and with all the threats that are at our border, I think uh, what you are doing is extremely uh, vital for our future and the future of our kids. Now, uh, let me introduce a bit Melexis. Melexis is a semiconductor company rooted in Belgium. Um, it was founded uh, in 89, and in fact, we specialize into automotive semiconductors because 90% of what we sell goes into automotive. So we make cars more sustainable, uh, we reduce emissions of cars, uh, we make them safer, and sometimes we make them sexier too. Now, most of what we do goes outside of Europe. 66% of our sales is done outside of Europe, mainly in, uh, in Asia. Um, the products we make, they are um, not the 2 nano and 5 nano uh, meter advanced uh, silicon, as uh, many are talking about now in the European Union, but uh, chips that, in fact, um, translate the real world into the digital world and vice versa. So it's edge sensors and edge drivers. That's in fact uh, what we do. And we have about 18 chips in every new car that comes off an assembly plant somewhere in the world. And some of the, um, of the cars have ma many more and certainly the uh, battery electric vehicles have many more. 
And for example, in the ID3 of Volkswagen, um, for our German colleagues here, we have more than 30. Uh, for our American, the Tesla, we have uh, more than 50 in, uh, in Teslas, in every Tesla. And um, again, for the German colleagues, the, the highest uh, the highest number we have in the EQS, Mercedes EQS, with more than 170 chips uh, in there. China as well, but China is not present here. Uh, uh, also, the BYD, for example, is more than 50. Now, let's uh, move to the topic of today. And I'd like to make a bit of a SWOT uh, analysis, so strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of the European context. Um, and I'd like to start with the threats, then the weaknesses, to then go to the strengths and the opportunities, uh, because the good stuff always comes last. Threats. I think uh, it's no surprise uh, that Europe lags behind. It lags behind uh, in technology, um, and definitely in key technologies uh, behind the US, behind uh, Asia, particularly China and uh, Japan and South Korea. And because of what is happening uh, at our borders, a robust Europe is indeed arguably needed more than ever. Now, there are different kinds of threats. There is, first of all, the economic threat. And if you look at this, uh, this is one graph, but there are many like this, is the number of companies that uh, cannot fill their ICT vacancies. But it's the same for all the STEM vacancies. And you see that the, the chart uh, is turning upwards. So now, uh, the uh, EU28, they're on top there, they're, they almost cannot fill 70% of their ICT vacancies, which is definitely problematic. And uh, I think you all know why, but I'll, I'll give you some more uh, details after on, afterwards. So there is definitely a lack of STEM talent uh, as such. Two, there are also societal threats. And the societal threats have to do with diversity and inclusion. We are living in a data uh, society. But if your data is corrupted, or if your data is only half true, which mostly it is, and uh, a good book to read on this one and to open your eyes is Invisible Women, Exposing Data Bias in a World Designed for Men. Uh, because you'll be extremely surprised uh, uh, of all the, uh, the nice uh, examples that uh, Criado Perez is giving. And just one thing is, why do you think that, uh, or when do you think symphonic orchestras, to go outside of STEM, symphonic orchestras now are, oh, when did they start getting more diverse? Question mark. Anyone has an idea? Yes? Oh, you read the book. <laughs> exactly. Because behind a screen, you cannot see if it's a lady or a gentleman. You cannot see if the, person, the musician is old or young or ugly or beautiful. No, it's just the music that decides uh, for it. And great, but many, many other examples in, in that book. Now, knowing that AI will uh, definitely have a very big impact uh, uh, in our world uh, and in the future, I think it's important that we take care of not having data bias or that we fight against it. And the best way is, in fact, to also make sure that your developer community is as diverse as it is, uh, possibly, uh, as it is possible. Because if we don't, then if AI will start making some decisions for us, not all of the decisions, but some decisions, it could be that uh, from a world that is today, in Europe at least, it's one of the strengths of Europe, that we're pretty inclusive, that it will turn around and that uh, AI, without having um, a clear view on data bias, 
that it will exacerbate inequality and social injustice on a global scale. Now let's turn to the weaknesses. Um, it's clear that uh, when you look at Europe, uh, at our corporate performance, it's underwhelming and it's particularly due to the tech creating industries. And if you look at how historically our output has grown in number of STEM expertise, uh, so STEM students, um, then you can see that, and I don't know if it's, yeah, it's pretty uh, clear, that China, for example, has in increased over the years, over the past years, by m more than double than what we have done in Europe, and for that matter, also in the US. So that means if this continues, we will continue to lag more behind every uh, single year. So that's a weakness that we really need to address. And we do have a leaky STEM pipeline. Uh, over, the STEM, over the educational uh, career, we lose a lot of, uh, of, of people, we lose a lot of kids for several reasons, and we mainly lose girls. And the reasons, I think, are pretty clear. Uh, in the meantime, I think the research body is enormous uh, in the meantime. So what we need to do is to make sure that we stop these leaks as much as possible and that we start early on. Now, um, we do have a bit of a girl problem. It's a, it's a weakness, but it's also an opportunity at the same time. If you uh, look at this graph, you'll see that on top, uh, where is the pointer? No, no pointer, doesn't work. Um, if you look on top, it's the number of uh, graduates in tertiary education per thousand of population age 20 to 29. So these are really the, uh, the outputs that we're seeing today in recent years. EU 27 countries, 21. The best in class on the top graph is Ireland. So that's also a good thing because we can learn uh, from the successful countries. Um, if you look at the bottom graph, then it starts becoming uh, yeah, uh, sad because the EU 27 countries average uh, is 14 for uh, girls, which is much too low. Uh, it should be uh, much more than that. And I think we should double the top graph and we should probably triple uh, the, the, the bottom graph. But boys and girls need different approaches and we know that too. Now I could talk about this for ages, but I've only got 20 minutes uh, here. Uh, so let's, um, uh, we can talk about that definitely later. But I think we also have a boys problem. Um, and I think we might have one because I have not found any figures and I'm talking uh, of the experience that we have in Flanders, uh, which could be very different in other countries. That is that uh, if you look at early leavers from education, these are mostly boys, and these are mostly boys from less um, favorable uh, environments. But this is also, and it's good that that graph is going down. Uh, however, uh, I think there is still a way to go. And if you see that we may leave 10% of our kids uh, lingering somewhere and they never can catch up anymore uh, in later lives, in their later life, then it's, it's really something we should not uh, uh, let happen in, in, in Europe at this moment in time. Now, Europe also has strengths, and the strengths uh, are um, pretty much related to our high quality education. I think we should be proud uh, of that. Um, we should be proud of our welfare state, uh, but without uh, a good economy, uh, a welfare state is hardly uh, tenable. Um, we should also be proud, if you look at the, the, the graph here, we should be proud about the fact that our sustainability um, uh, metrics 
and our inclusion metrics are really good. It's the blue dot. Um, U.S. is mostly behind us, and in some cases, in two cases, China is a bit uh, uh, further than, than us. But here we talk about stuff like social progress, uh, social mobility, life expectancy, uh, life satisfaction. Um, and I think this is something to cherish and to keep going. Europe has also a strong SME um, uh, based economy. And uh, we're extremely good at automotive, for example. We're also apparently very good at luxury goods. <laughs> uh, and we have some sockets of, uh, of excellence in the chemical industry, um, in the pharma and life sciences industry. So it's not that we are without strengths. Um, but STEM talent is also needed in order to keep those strengths uh, at level and not to let ourselves be taken over by uh, the US or uh, China, but keep up the pace. The opportunity is also there. If you look at uh, this OECD um, uh, study, it tells us that a highly skilled STEM uh, worker brings three to four times more productivity gain than a highly skilled non-STEM worker. It goes without saying that also the vocational um, uh, level, so not only the academic but also the vocational level, and for me high skilled is not only academic. I want to point that out because high skilled is equally vocational. Um, it's different, but it's equally needed and it's also high skilled. So this is an opportunity for educational institutions to work together with uh, companies. And I'm very glad also to, to hear when I uh, discussed over lunch uh, with some people that you see that this is happening in, uh, in, in our countries. But we need to move the needle. Uh, and if you remember the slide with uh, how much does the output grow every year, it's definitely absolutely insufficient. Let me go a bit soft here now. I think we need to go for a moonshot. We should be totally, unreasonably ambitious in what we do. My personal moonshot is, before I go away from this world, which is still about 40 years because I want to live to 100, um, before I leave this world, I would like to see and have contributed actively to a gender balance in all STEM areas. And I think what this group should do as EU STEM coalition is our moonshot should be an all-inclusive world where technology is at the service of people, where we use it for uh, caring for not only people but also places and planets, the three PP, PPPs. It's about social cohesion. It's about partnership and solidarity that need to reign. But it also is very clear that a good cognition, so good education and good cognition, is a harbinger of tolerance. And it goes against polarization of our society. If your kid, or even not the youngster, but if somebody can't read graphs, uh, can't understand the language that is used when your government or whoever talks to you, um, then some parties can take advantage of that and polarize. So it is incredibly important to have a very good base STEM literacy. Uh, and of course, if you uh, go for um, strengthening STEM literacy from early on, then of course it increases the chances also of those uh, youngsters going for a STEM-heavy uh, educational career. So let's go for the moonshot. What can we do? I think it boils down 
mostly to three um, areas of action. It's addressing the unconscious bias we have. It's showcasing inspiring uh, role models, inspiring examples of people in the first place, but also of actions. And it's also about enhancing um, interdisciplinary STEM literacy and teaching it in a real life context. I'm very glad that the next speaker, the Eurydice uh, study is indeed extremely um, interesting because it proves that uh, fact uh, very, very clearly. Now, oops, there we go. Um, STEM and the 21st century skills, so the interdisciplinarity uh, and, uh, or multidisciplinarity, is in fact a marriage made in heaven because critical thinking uh, is um, taught in, uh, in STEM, problem solving. Uh, of course, you need to collaborate because if you have an interdisciplinary team, then uh, you get to results by collaborating well. So I think that um, this is um, good for us to make sure that we, um, in our uh, circle of influence, that we continue to insist on this uh, enormously important STEM uh, education, but also the um, interdisciplinarity. Sometimes we talk about science and maths, but we forget the T and the E, the technology and the engineering, but interdisciplinary thinking and doing is important to enhance the literacy of the STEM literacy of, of everyone. Because you can't be what you can't see, it is indeed important to showcase inspiring examples. And one of the, um, one of the facts that came out of a, um, I think it was a study, a meta-analysis by the European Commission, said when you only showcase 15 minutes of a passionate female professional or executive or researcher or whatever in a classroom, it increases the confidence level of the girls in that classroom by several percentages. So if you do that over the educational career all the time, and you have always 50-50 of those examples, and you need to make sure that the examples are also as diverse as the people you have in the environment, in the local environment, so people of color, uh, people maybe with a bit of a funny hairdo, or I don't know what. Uh, so it has to be as diverse as possible, because you can be what you can see, or if you can see it, you can be it. So if they recognize themselves, if the, the, the students recognize themselves in the examples you put forward, then uh, they will say, ah, if she can do it, I can do it too. And then addressing unconscious bias is a third thing that I think we have to continue continuously be attentive for. Just as one example, the example I uh, put forward before on the, the 15 minutes of, uh, of a passionate female researcher, for example, comes out also out of that study, um, gender gaps in education. There is a lot of evidence there. There is a lot of, uh, of, of learnings and best practices from the whole world. It's not only from Europe. But one of those unconscious biases is teachers can be very pro-boy biased. And that, can, that teacher, that can, be a, uh, that can also be a lady teacher. Eh? It's not only the male teachers that have uh, biases. We all have biases. But if we're conscious about it, then we will also be able to um, adapt our language, adapt our, uh, the images that we use when we, uh, or the stories that we tell, to, to students or to our kids. So it's important, I think, to look at that as well. 
These are three main things that uh, we can do and concretely uh, take care of in our everyday when we take action, when we put out action plans. I think they should always be in our minds. Now, here um, told you that um, he asked me because there is a lot going on in the European uh, Union, of course, but if you look at this uh, 2022 State of the Union address by our president, then a lot of things that she mentioned, uh, Next Generation EU, European Green Deal, Fit for 55, etc., and last but not least, also the European CHIPS Act, the, all these initiatives need STEM talent. There is no way around it. And as said, the lack of STEM talents is already very big and the historical growth is not good enough. How do we make sure uh, that to, to bring all that about is we need to clearly mention the societal benefits. Fit for 55, for example, is meaning let's take care of our planet, let's take care of our environment. Um, the point is, in everything we do, and uh, I, I hear that also when I talk to, uh, to, to you, is societal benefits are important for youngsters in general, but particularly also for girls. So any action should clearly make the link between what is the is that what I'm, uh, what I'm learning important and is it useful? But for what is it useful in real life? And how do I help the planet? How do I help people with, uh, with what I'm seeing? In the European CHIPS Act, um, it's clear without chips, there is no party. Uh, the, um, one of the, um, the links that I could make is um, a professor uh, that um, is a good friend of mine. She, she's working in a chips design in, in Belgium. And she said, you know, when you go to the doctors, then you know what the doctor does. Uh, it's clear for everyone. But the doctor uses equipment, and that equipment is made by engineers, by technicians, um, but these people are not seen by the patient. So they are far away from uh, what happens. But then if you uh, look at what chips, what integrated circuits, semiconductors are needed in order to put into those equipments, and you hardly see these engineers or these technicians, they are much, much further away from the patient. So that means we need to bring those uh, elements together and explain the whole value chain behind it in order to stimulate youngsters to go for uh, champagne. Now, the skills in the semiconductor, we have in the semiconductor industry, in fact, the same problems as most of the industries uh, have. But one thing is definitely also clear from uh, our industry is that the skills requirements are really changing. Just as a, an example, when you look at the different uh, generations of semiconductor factories, um, to the left is maybe the 90s, in the middle it's the, maybe the past two decades, but what we are looking at today is more and more robotization, automation uh, in also our factories. Now, this is the same in almost every tech industry. And the Pact for Skills on Microelectronics wants to make that, uh, or wants to address all these challenges. And we have three deliverables, um, and it's, it would be great uh, to be able to talk to some of you also this afternoon on uh, how you could make, uh, uh, how could you contribute. It's in fact three deliverables, a university, uh, a European-wide university network where we look at what are the particular skills for the semiconductor industries, what have the universities and university colleges to offer in that uh, area, and how can we make sure that we put them uh, together in a network and offer them to uh, the, the youngsters 
and also for upskilling and reskilling uh, of, um, of grown-ups. The image campaign is the second deliverable, but in the two deliverables, we will always take into account DEI, which stands there as a third deliverable. We will all, always integrate in any action we do, how can we integrate and how can we be inclusive in the language that we use, in the images that we use, and in the stories that we put forward. So um, the Pact for Skills on Microelectronics is under the hood of SEMI, which is the uh, European, um, a, a European federation of semiconductor companies. And uh, I'm part also of the executive board there. So um, if you have any questions on this or if there would be interest, just uh, let me know. I think I'm done, but I wouldn't be a tech entrepreneur if I wouldn't have just one more thing to say. Yes, I think we can be crazy, but if we're not crazy and unreasonably ambitious, we will not change the world. As Steve Jobs uh, said clearly, and you know, may the Steminist force be with us and let's go for it. Let's go for that moonshot. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Schombard, for a very interesting opening speech. Uh, as we just heard, sufficient availability of STEM-skilled people is crucial for Europe's future economic competitiveness and resilience, and that, in a sense, Europe is also falling behind on the rest of the world here. You also covered the societal challenges caused by the way that, for example, data is being used uh, by humans, but also by AI. Uh, and, and things like the underrepresentation of girls that is caused by unconscious biases, for example, by teachers in the classroom. We spoke about recruitment challenges as well, uh, which can, of course, partially be solved by uh, tackling this uh, gender uh, challenge that we have. Uh, and finally, you presented some, uh, some solutions, like, for example, the use of role models uh, with a higher level of diversity. As we all know, addressing all these challenges that we covered here um, will require a thorough understanding of how the way we organize our education systems affect uh, the learning outcomes, which brings us to our next speaker, uh, who is Mrs. Akvil Motijernaite Schulmeister of the European Education and Culture Executive Agency. Uh, she is one of the senior analysts who worked on the report Increasing Achievement and motivation in mathematics and science learning in schools. And we'll present here today via video link uh, some of the key findings. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Motijernete, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Hope you hear me. Yes, we hear you very well. OK, so all set. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. And sorry for my difficult name. I'm Lithuanian, married to Austrian, living in Brussels, doing research on Europe. So this is the small background. Um, now I would like to start with sharing my screen, if I may. You see it? Yeah. OK. So um, this is the first slide that now we don't need anymore. I start directly now with the first image that I wanted to show to you. I'm very grateful with the lovely images of the previous speaker. This really inspires. And I wanted to show you one image that actually speaks a lot to my heart. This is the image of excitement, of fun, of feeling of power of nature, of the power of science. I'm sure some of you have tried a similar roto ride in your lives. For me, I still remember the first time the feeling I tried, the fear and the awe and the really the forces of nature on my body enacted. But today here, I want to say one more, um, uh, one more aspect about it. This roto ride, or any time I see this in a, an amusement park, it always reminds me of my physics teacher. I had amazing physics teacher in my lower secondary school. He was one of the best teachers I had, actually. And he often used examples, 
very clear examples from the world around us. And I still remember today that in one of the lessons he gave us to calculate something based on the rotorite example. And this was really a fun activity that most of us kids in the class have already experienced and enjoyed. And I actually remember the eyes lit up, the eyes lit up with excitement. So in my presentation today, I would like to focus on how to make students interested, how to make their lives lit, lit up. And uh, more concretely today, I first will say a few facts about science and math teaching at schools in Europe. Then I will briefly say a few words about our findings, namely what can be done to improve achievement. And then I will focus today on the question on how to relate science and mathematics teaching to student life. One of the three findings that were just highlighted as very important in STEM education nowadays. So let's get started now with the student achievement. This is what the, how to say, the dependent variable in our analysis, which is of course an outcome of um, various factors at country, student and school level. Here today, in my presentation, I will discuss measures at country level. Uh, our report and our analysis focused on low achievers, which are defined as students who perform below the minimum level that is necessary to participate successfully in society. As the previous speaker said, exactly, we really should not have people, should not have students who can't read graphs, who can't understand what the politicians say on TV. We have to raise students and children that understand what's going on around us. So this was our focus. And um, here, I think you might be familiar with this figure, but I want to give an overview. So this shows the percentage of low achievers among 15 year olds in mathematics and science in European countries based on ECD's Program for International Student Assessment Survey, the PISA survey. The countries are ranked here on mathematics, but as the figure shows, the percentages are quite similar both in mathematics and science. Um, so the percent, the figure shows here that percentage of underachieving students, so those who cannot read graphs, um, varies from 10% to 60% in European countries. So the, the differences are huge. So it's clear that there is a chance to learn from each other and to see what those countries that succeed in achieving basic levels of numeracy and literacy do different than com those countries that don't. So this was sort of our, our direction of, uh, of uh, inquiry. So just to uh, say that you see another thing in the graph, which is the 15% line, which is the EU target. Uh, EU already for a long time is trying to reduce the level of low achieving students in reading, mathematics and science for below 15%. So far, this uh, has been now moved from 2020 to 2030. And let's aim high and let's hope that this will be achieved with the help of uh, discussions in such conferences as this and then of course the actions that translate in real world. Here I just want to highlight since you are in France now on a lovely location in the south of France I wanted to highlight the situation of the country that most of the participants are in. So France is around the middle, a bit to the lower side, meaning the better achieving side, and the proportion of children that rank below minimum numeracy and the scientific literacy is approximately 21% in mathematics and science. Before I continue, the last note here, I show PISA results for 15 year olds, but we covered also the primary education and uh, there will be some, uh, some information on that. Just important to remember that the proportion of low achieving students very highly correlates across education levels. So the proportion in primary education, whether it's measured by national tests or TIMS or anything else, highly correlates with PISA or other, uh, or TIMS later on at age uh, eight. Now, let me go to the main results. So what did we find? What are those countries doing better 
than, or, than those. But are those countries that have lower proportion of low achieving students do better than those who do not? So what are the main factors that contribute to high achievement at country level? We found five main things. We are very happy. We found things that work and actually that make sense. That are the issues that we can concentrate in the future on the on the country level. And uh, one of the first things was learning support. It seems obvious that um, when the learning support is available to students that are falling behind, there is a chance they will catch up. But this is also confirmed by the regulation. So in countries that do have assigned learning support during the formal school day, not after, not during the holidays, not during the weekends, but during the formal school day, do have lower proportions of low achieving students, both in primary and lower secondary education. Remedial teachers is another very important factor. So basically remedial teachers, we call those teachers who are specialized and trained in, learn, in providing learning support for children. Uh, this is also important both in, in primary and lower secondary education. Very interesting finding where we connected actually our data collection from different sources. It's about the uh, overall instruction time. We found that um, longer overall instruction time in lower secondary education correlates positively with lower proportion of low achieving students. So achievement is higher in those countries that allocate more time to mathematics and science. Systemic monitoring is also important. Here we um, used um, availability of national tests at primary level, I mean, indicator. And the last part, the part that I will focus today is uh, curriculum that fosters reflection. So this was the main overview, but before going into this, I was asked to discuss a little bit about teachers, the main people in the Mm, uh, the most important people in education. And as the previous speaker raised an issue as a girl's problem, boy's problem, here I would like to add most likely teacher's problem to the list. Because as we know, there is a high shortage of teachers in, in, uh, in Europe. But let me first start with uh, the importance of teachers who are trained in supporting low achieving students. This is, we are talking about, as the previous speaker showed, the pipeline of STEM that is dripping less and less and less by the end. So we are concentrating on the beginning of the pipeline, on the first part of it, and to see how we can raise the water level there in the beginning, how we can raise the general level of, of basic numeracy, basic scientific literacy. How do we get the children to understand the basic things like reading the graphs. So remedial teachers or teachers specialized in support when this is available at the country level, meaning when there is such a role assigned to teachers in schools, when there is such a profession and such specialization on the country level, seem to be related with um, better learning support. So basically lower proportion of low achievers. However, our results show that uh, only about one third of countries have it, and this um, this actually relates to mathematics. Um, remedial teachers in the field of mathematics, in science there is even less. So what's left then? What the, in, what's left in the other countries? Usually classroom teachers. And here I, I will show you one map, very red map. In red, there are shown the, the, the countries that report that there is a shortage of mathematics and science teachers. And this is really quite, uh, quite, um, um, quite all over Europe. So this is a general um, background. I'm finishing with that part. And now let's go to the main point how to increase student interest. And what did we do to, to come with our findings? We asked experts in 39 European education systems in all the European countries that participate in Erasmus Plus uh, program uh, to answer if um, certain aspects of curricula are mentioned, uh, are included, uh, certain aspects in science and mathematics are included in the curricula. I will briefly show you what did we look at. Uh, very briefly, we looked at real life applications and mathematics. 
and also at the context-based science teaching, namely history of science and science of ethics issues. I will show you the examples a bit later on. But maybe first a small disclaimer. Um, I need to tell you that, of course, we understand that curricula does not tell us exactly what happens in the classroom. However, we somehow tend to believe and think that uh, when certain topic is part of curricula, this increases the likelihood that the topic will be actually addressed by teachers in the classroom. Still, on the other hand, when a certain issue is not mentioned in curriculum, the topic could nevertheless be part of a textbook or a project work or included uh, um, by, by teacher. However, learning materials and textbooks were not part of our analysis because this is really a huge autonomy across schools and countries, um, to, across schools in, in countries to, to choose uh, what, uh, what is used. So that's a disclaimer now. I immediately want to show you that most likely our results actually relate to real life. Let's start with mathematics in real life. And here I start with um, a, a big figure from uh, Tim's uh, survey, uh, the, another survey we use, which uh, is abbreviation for Trends in International Mathematics and Science Study. Um, which shows that math mathematics teachers of 52% of fourth graders in the EU say that they relate almost every lesson to students' daily life. Almost no teachers said they never relate lessons to student lives. So, and let's see what did we, what did we find in our analysis? Uh, we explored quite uh, quite a few different contexts when we asked uh, about applications of mathematics in curriculum, in real life applications of mathematics in curriculum. Sorry, the first example was related to money problem solving. This refers to simple calculations and measurement involving money for computing total cost changes unit prices or percentages. According to our analysis, this was the most widespread functional context of mathematics. A lot of countries mentioned that understanding the value of money was one of the goals in this field. For example, in the Latvian curriculum for grade one states that students should be able to understand the price of goods in euros and cents in situations with a domestic context in pictures, they need to use and create shopping lists with quantity and price, consider different ways in which the required amount can be paid. This and similar examples you can read in, the, in, in our report. There are many, many with uh, exact page numbers of where you can find, so you can have a look for, for further reference. There is um, a link at the end of my presentation. Regarding money, we also looked at the team basic financial literacy. So this is more like a calculation of credit and interest, um, gross and net income, making a budget and stuff like that. These tasks may be considered like a next level of difficulty and were more present in all the grades. So for example, in Norway, in grade five pupils are expected to be able to create and solve tasks in a spreadsheet for personal finances. Mathematical notions are also commonly used in architecture and can be used at schools to show how mathematics is applied in real life. So, for example, in Serbia, guidelines for teachers in grade four state that student skills for space and area measurement should be developed using examples such as floor covering by tiles, estimation of area of a playground or classroom, etc. Finally, Mathematical concepts may be employed in practical activities such as cooking or do it yourself, like wood, woodcraft. Such uh, contexts are suggested in the curricula of half of our analyzed countries. Of course, baking a cake at school um, might be a nice activity, but takes a lot of time. However, solving map uh, problems using examples from recipes can be done at school. And for example, in lower secondary, Estonian curriculum expects students to create menus for an event, calculate food costs, and know how to compile a budget for an event. 
here now I want to quickly show the overview of our results. I know this is a bit of a big um, graph, but wanted to show a bit inside of our methodology. We looked at grades one to four and grades five to eight, partly to align with the TIM study, but partly to, to have like four plus four the first for eight uh, grades at, at school. We also made a distinction between whether a certain topic was mentioned in mathematics on in, or in other subjects, because, well, this might be part of some other curricula, but still uh, still discuss the same issue. So, for example, mathematics in cooking or do-it-yourself activities is often uh, discussed in the fields of technology and crafts while basic financial literacy is uh, often part of entrepreneurship education or uh, economics in, 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 uh, in all the grades. So after now presenting you the, the what did we look at, I have to say that mathematics in real life with mathematics in real life, we didn't really find a relationship with the proportion of low achievers. There might be a few explanations. First, it seems to be very widespread and being one of the main goals of mathematics, both in first four grades and even more in grades five to eight. Second, most likely or possibly that our questions might have been too simple. But the third uh, explanation, I think that there might be a distinction between imaginary real life problems or real life examples from adult life and the actual real life problems that indeed relate to children life. I have two small children and um, I was really thinking how much the example of money really relates to their life. For the first Great at school, I don't think this, that the children really go and do shopping on their own. Moreover, with increased use of credit cards, mm, coins and notes are not really that big present of their life. It's like a bit of a new language to learn on the top of mathematics. So this is just small note to think for the future research on the issue once we are trying to increase the motivation and interest. So just a quick Reminder, we now cover this topic and let's go to the context-based science teaching. This, this idea in general emphasizes that philosophical, historical and societal aspects of science and technology are important to better understand the, these fields. This approach, of course, has been shown to increase students' motivation, to engage in scientific studies and maybe possibly lead to increased take up of scientific careers later on in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the path of education. Compared to real life applications of mathematics, these two areas, history of science and science and ethics were much less common in curricula during the first eight grades at school. Let's now go to the history of science and um, here, is a, a picture of a sculpture of Galileo Galilei contemplating the nature of the universe. And I have to say, it's not really in the report, but my personal feeling looking at all the curricula, I found this picture a bit, a bit uh, reflecting how, in my opinion, uh, history of science is taught in curricula, in science curricula. It looks very static, quite grim, and quite distant. It doesn't really relate to children's lives. I don't know. This, if we talk about like inspiring, interesting ideas and how it, what's what the meaning to 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 people at that time, I didn't really get that feeling much. So that was why I chose this picture. Now I showed the results. It's for grades five to eight because for grades one to four. These topics were even less addressed. Uh, a few observations. The first history of science was often uh, included as a general reference somewhere in the introduction or a general part of curricula or often part of a history curricula. So a small sentence here and there. Not sure how this actually then later on translates into classroom practice. 
evolution of scientific ideas over time were a bit more interesting, I think. For example, I can give you an example from Portugal, where the physics chemistry subject in grade seven includes the topic universe and distances in the universe where students should be able to explain the role of observation and the instruments used in the historical evolution of knowledge of the universe. So this was uh, one of the nice um, examples and clear examples. Great scientists and their lives are a bit present, a bit less than in a half of the countries, with often with the tasks like making a presentation on a scientist and so on, but very interesting. Women in science are almost not there at all. And I really was coming back to countries and asking, are you sure? Can you give me some example? Try to find some example. Nothing, almost nothing. Maybe in the test books, maybe in some extracurricular work, but like in the main curriculum, really almost nothing. So if we talk about inspiring role models, about inviting uh, girls to, um, to these fields, we have to put a bit of women when we teach science. Maybe, okay, maybe it's done for a bit later grades, but, you know, we have to start from the beginning. We have to show this, that it's not like for the first eight grades at school, it's just males who are doing the science. And now at the last grades, we show a few examples of women. I think this is really one important finding uh, that we should uh, take for our education later on. So here, I have to say that with this grim picture of a very static scientist sculpture, we didn't find the relationship between the inclusion of history of science topics with the proportion of low achievers at the country level. However, we found this with science and ethics. This was actually really funny because we thought that we might not find anything, but well, it's curriculum level, country level, like might, there might not be that many relations. We found one. And maybe this indeed makes sense. Hopefully this makes sense. And why? So science and ethics or socio-scientific questions refer to open-ended social problems, conceptual links to science. It was not very commonly addressed. When present, these questions are usually part of biology lessons in lower secondary education. Many countries provided some examples of general reference, um, like in Finland, pupils are given opportunities to practice making choices and acting in a sustainable way. In biology lessons for grades seven to nine, pupils examine the opportunities and challenges of biotechnology. And then with the more concrete examples like GMOs or morality of weapon development, maybe was not the best example, or ethical considerations in animal testing. We found a few nice examples, but this you can read up in, 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 the, in the report um, later on. Um, now, if I, look, if I show you what is, how this looks on the map, this looks actually better because a lot of big countries, large countries, include these questions. But still, if we count the number of countries, this was in less than half addressed, but covers quite much of European population. But how did we show the relationship? Now, in a very simplistic terms, I know you are many scientists there who, uh, who can understand very complex issues, but here I showed very simple. I um, Here I uh, marked in diagonal those countries that have fewer than 20% of 15-year-olds that are low achievers in science. I have to include 20% under 20 because under 15 there are so few, as I said, four countries that might not really show a big relationship. But here, if we put the results together, the proportion of low achievers in those countries that address science and ethics explicitly in their curricula is lower than in those countries where this is not addressed. So this is our way of trying to find relationships. The difference was statistically significant here. So we can conclude in quite general terms that most likely when students are invited to explore moral dilemmas in biotechnology, when students are invited to explain their own opinions about animal testings or name risks and opportunities posed by technological progress, basic levels of science literacy tend to be 
overall on, on general a bit higher than in those countries where students are maybe less encouraged to discuss this question. Last very small note now before I'm finishing, uh, I wanted to connect with another area that we explored, and this is much more in the in the report about in general uh, how um, uh, digital um, learning uh, outcomes are integrated in mathematics and science curricula. But I wanted just to say that one important point maybe to look at is also digital literacy in science curricula. If uh, we dis uh, we live now in in the society that is very much accessing information through digital. Well, like me today, I'm online <laughs> presenting from home. So a lot of stuff is online nowadays. And um, with increasing amount of misinformation and even spread of anti-science movements, it is essential that our children learn to navigate this. So in addition to sort of a general digital literacy goals and, um, and inclusion in curricula, we looked at whether it's part of science curricula. So because children also need to learn how to find scientific content online, what sources to use, how to use many sources, how to find which sources are, are, are reliable and how to verify the information. For meaningful discussions on science and ethics issues, of meaningful understand of understanding also so social scientific issues, we need the children learn how to navigate this. So, at least our results show that two thirds of countries currently in Europe have at least some mention of this in the curricula. So this looks quite reassuring. For example, in Spain. A learning standard for physics and chemistry in grade eight includes identify the main characteristics linked to reliability and objectivity of the existing information flow on the internet and other digital media. So that's exactly what we were looking for. That's a very nice statement. Um, with this now, I'm coming to the conclusion. And um, we started with one element, with one fun, uh, ride on a roto right and now i hope that uh, you have a bit bigger picture a bit bigger understanding of what fun can be had in science and math and i hope i got some sparkle in some eyes although yeah unfortunately i, I cannot see you presenting from far away from my home so what can we say as a few conclusions unfortunately we have this basic deal with the basic fact that many children in Europe do not reach basic numeracy and scientific literacy. And we have not enough teachers, not enough good teachers and not enough support teachers. These are the field. This is the field that really should be addressed somehow. But we can try certain things. For example, we can try to relate to real life, but talking about real life to the real, real life, not imaginary problems from adult life, but real life as much as it can get for children to really feel the usefulness and the need of, of mathematics. And it seems to be very important to engage students to reflect, to ask the questions, not only uh, what and when and what was done, but like, what does it mean to me? What does it mean to us and to engage them? And yeah, let's not forget that there should be a bit of women in science shown in the curriculum as well. So thank you. Thank you for the attention. Thank you for this opportunity. Here's the link, the link to connect to, to our, the links to connect to our organization. And the, the thank you to all the people who worked for this report. This was really a big cooperation across Europe. Here now with this, I give the floor back to, to you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Motijanaiti, uh, for presenting uh, the results, which definitely have implications for the work of the national STEM platforms as well, especially if we think about, for example, providing more context to the curriculum. For those who are interested to learn more, we will also share the link to the report, uh, to the full report in the meeting documents and on our EU STEM coalition website. That brings us to the next presentation of today, for which we will step back from the European context for, for a minute and uh, look at the United States. And for that, I would like to give the word to Mr. James Brown, who is the Executive Director of the STEM Education Coalition in Washington, D.C. Uh, Mr. Brown, welcome. 
the floor is yours. We yes, see... it's Dan Cole. Yeah. Yes, can Perfect. you hear me? The connection is very good now. Okay, uh, so it's a pleasure to be with the European STEM Coalition this morning. I was uh, I was lucky enough to be at the launch of the EU STEM Coalition in Amsterdam in 2014, and I have to tell you, it's uh, it's heartening to listen to so many of the same themes um, being discussed in Europe as as we are in the United States. A lot of similar challenges and a lot of uh, similar thought put to how best to deal with them. So. Um, let me just start by telling you a little bit about who we are. So these are the members of the STEM Education Coalition. We're a coalition of three sectors, the business community from all different shapes and sizes of companies, from, from tech companies like Apple and Microsoft, people who make things, auto manufacturers, people who, uh, who make agricultural products. The interest in STEM education is across the board in terms of industries. The second part of our membership are the education community. So the science teachers and the math teacher organizations, um, other disciplines that teach in education, as well as groups like the After School Alliance that, uh, that deal with out of school programs that have a focus on STEM. And then we have all of the professional organizations. So the chemists, the engineers, the different uh, disciplines in the STEM fields, as well as organizations like the National Society of Professional um, the National Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers and the National Society of Black Engineers, which represent communities that are marginalized in the STEM fields. And what holds us together is a goal of trying to influence policies in the United States for the advancement of science, technology, engineering, and math education. So we spend our time working with Congress, with the, the presidential administration, with state governments, trying to influence policies that lead to improvement of outcomes in STEM education. So this is what our, our radar screen looks like right now in the fall of 2022. I'm going to talk about each of these topics, but you know, there's a very clear sense of the recognition that we're not doing very well in education, that the pandemic exacerbated trends that were already underway and, and have made many, many of the outcomes that we care about in STEM education, you know, falling instead of rising, and that is reversing many years of, of small but modest continued gains. This is also coupled with widespread workforce shortages, and I'll talk a little bit more about the nature of those. They're obviously linked, and this is coming at a time when the economic outlook is also very mixed. Um, inflation is really changing the economy in the United States and affecting many of the outcomes that are related to STEM education. And against this backdrop, um, we've seen pretty big legislative actions in the last two years. If you've followed the recovery process in the United States, you've probably seen that we've passed enormous relief packages, fiscal stimulus. We all, it was hard to hear there's a, there's a CHIPS conversation in Europe that's parallel to ours. We passed a bill called the CHIPS Act to deal with semiconductor manufacturing that has a number of important STEM components to it. I'll talk about that. And then just wrapping up talking about the nature of our challenges as STEM advocates. So these are some of the headlines from about a week ago. And it's unusual to see these four news sources, Fox News, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, all have more or less the same headline, which is this recognition that there is widespread learning loss that has occurred as a result of the pandemic. And if we were having this conversation a year ago, I think there were a lot of people in the United States tiptoeing around the question of, was online learning or no school at all, you know, really a bad thing for students? It seems like a common sense answer that it was, but the United States, and this is, a, I think, a contrast with most of Europe, we spent a lot longer without schools learning in person, and I think have very much suffered for it. And so since our audience are policymakers, if you had a congressional town hall right now where you had somebody meet with their constituency, this would be a big focus of what that discussion was about. And I think the sentiment from parents, at least, would be our kids are not learning the things they need to be competitive in the world economy. That's sort of the nature of that theme. The other headline, if you will, is this somewhat ironic labor shortage in the sense that the unemployment in the United States is at a almost historic low now. It's below 4% again. We're back to pre-pandemic unemployment levels. But conversely, 
U.S. tech sector employers especially are having an enormous time hiring for what I would call middle-skilled jobs, the technician jobs, the people who operate factories, the people who, who run airlines, the people who staff hospitals. The middle-skilled jobs are, are the, the essence of the, the shortage of labor right now. And it's, it's also ironic that you will see headlines now. <clears throat> Intel, for example, is announcing layoffs. And one of the reasons for their layoffs is they were not able to hire enough people to operate certain facilities which means they're missing business targets, which is, you know, is, is, a, is a very concerning spiral of relationships when you can't hire enough workers. So these two things in common characterize the environment for discussions about STEM education at, at the moment. And the other big backdrop is, of course, the story of inflation and the economic slowdown that's going on. And, you know, inflation in the United States has always become a political issue. It's always become an issue that threatens to to derail agendas and it relates back to education because education is a very expensive item in the United States. It's the majority, uh, it's the largest item in most state budgets. So increases in costs, for example, for school lunch materials have material impacts on state and local governments. And actually the interesting thing about the graph is um, bananas are the only thing that has increased in price in the United States. So for what it's worth, you know, send your kid to school with a banana is a bumper sticker here. Uh, so, the, you know, and I'm sure you're dealing with the same the same factors. The chart on the left shows, you know, the United States is, is ahead, but but many of the European countries are dealing with the same trends. And the other thing that, uh, and I was I was interested to see the previous presentation and talking about the nature of science content and and looking a little bit deeper. This is some data from several years ago that that shows the relative second class status, if you will, of science in terms of the amount of time it's being taught in the early grades. The, the, the recognition of, of early primary school science as a particular choke point in the STEM education pipeline is something that we've been focusing on for a number of years. It's exacerbated by the fact that our federal accountability rules for schools, the, the rules passed by Congress and implemented by the Department of Education, emphasize math and reading and not as much for science. And you can see that here. And we're actually on the verge of releasing a new study that will show that in many, many schools in 2020 and 2021, the time spent on science is much closer to zero than the, the 18 minutes per day that you see there. So, so that's another very, very concerning trend. And it's, it's, it's very interesting to see the ways in which this is similar in Europe and in the United States. So, as I sit here, this was the timestamp from yesterday, the, the United States policy environment is all about the election. One of the factors at work here is we expect there to be at least some changes in the makeup of Congress. And I won't dwell on this too long, but to say one of the factors that you may well see as a headline out of our election is the fact that the, the who do you trust question on education may have changed. So there's actually lots of polling out there especially from Democratic polling organizations to say the Democratic Party in the United States has lost its advantage on education, which, as you can see, goes back over 20 years. And so, again, the education backdrop in the United States, it's, it's always a political issue to some degree. But you may see some serious shifts in the way in which education is perceived that, that help to address some of these trends. So a little bit about how we talk about STEM education in the United States. So if you ask a person on the street, as, as one would say, what do you think about science, technology, engineering, and math? They hear the term STEM and they usually think about science, but when they talk about it, they will say things like, I am a science person, or more likely, I'm not a science person. I'm not a math person. I'm not an engineer. I don't, I don't know about those areas. They see it as a, as a form of identification. And if you talk to somebody who is an engineer, it's a big part of their identity. And that divide sort of characterizes the difficulty in talking about this issue with policymakers because many policymakers themselves have these same identity issues where they don't see themselves as a scientist. So, so they, they have a different view of how one deals with those issues from a policy standpoint. The other part of this is if you talk to employers about STEM, you will see they consider STEM to be on a spectrum of skills. And most employers will say every person in our company has some degree of STEM skills. That's part of their makeup. So you see a, a bifurcation of public opinion versus how companies and employers see the STEM skill set that, that always characterizes how we, we look at this issue from a policy standpoint. 
The second thing you'll see is, you know, the traditional image in American media of scientists is as the crazy scientists, as the nerd. Those images are changing, but they're also changing fairly slowly. And there's there's some regression in that front. The only area where you really see um, substantial change in imagery is in space. And part of the reason you see that is we now have a cons- commercial space industry where um, billionaires are launching themselves into space, and that's also inserting them, that itself into the image of who is a scientist or who is an astronaut, who occupies some of these jobs. But again, public perception is this is these are the images that kids tend to see in cartoons, for example. And then lastly, one of the aspects to public perception, and it was hinted on by both of the previous speakers to a great degree, was the fact that most students see the STEM workforce as old white males. And, you know, these images of short ties and short sleeve dress shirts are pretty commonplace if you if you look at kids and ask them their their views on science, technology, engineering and math. Um, that that's you know, that's something that I think we still face. In fact, I, I noted the um, uh, two speakers ago talking about the fact that these kind of biases are also held by teachers and they tend to be generational as well. So one of the things that, that new state of the art teaching um, teacher preparation programs are doing is trying to, to to push back on some of these unconscious biases and perceptions. So last thing I'll say, and this was also something that I think is echoed across the productivity spectrum and others in in the EU, is that no matter how you show the data, and a lot of times I would put a slide on here that was like 15 years out of date just to make the point, no matter how you slice the data, people with a STEM degree or a STEM job classification tend to do much better in the general economy. And this number, this divide between the average salary for a STEM worker versus a non-STEM occupation has widened in the last four years. So five years ago, those numbers were more like $80,000 for STEM workers and $49,000 for non-STEM workers. So that divide is very much very much um, rising. And the other part of this is, although it doesn't make a very good bumper sticker, you know, the, the negative metrics for STEM are also better. So, for example, when there are downturns in the economy, unemployment is lower for STEM workers than it is for non-STEM workers, for example. Um, and the likelihood of losing your job is is lower for a STEM worker. So, um, so you know, however you dice it, this is something that I think is still the strongest argument in terms of why we need more people in these professions. You know, these jobs are also productive in the economy. They're supporting innovation. But at the end of the day, the sales pitch for a majority of students will be, you will do better in these fields. And that's a strong, strong reason we need to keep repeating. So I talked about um, earlier the, the passage of a piece of legislation that may be of interest. So the United States has dealt with so-called competitiveness legislation about four or five times in the last 20 years. And, you know, the thematically, I, you know, I, I appreciate that discussion of looking at the position of the United States relative to the EU and to China. Um, in this case, this was squarely focused on making the United States more competitive relative to China around semiconductor manufacturing. And so one of the things this policy that was passed by Congress and, you know, just in July, but it was bipartisan, which is not very, very common in this, at least in this last couple of Congresses, was it makes the largest single investment in U.S. manufacturing in our entire history, and it reverses a trend of not having a so-called industrial policy, not investing in strategic industries, leaving that entirely to the private sector. So this was a bill that actually provided the cash immediately, $52 billion for semiconductor manufacturing, which is roughly 10 full-size semiconductor fabrication facilities. This would be paired with um, state dollars, and also company dollars. So there, there are a variety of funding streams that go into this, but this you know, is intended to, to, to strategically alter the map and locate fabs in the United States vis-a-vis um, their positioning in, in Taiwan and in China. The other thing it does, and it doesn't spend these $240 billion, but it authorizes a massive expansion of science and technology um, agencies in the United States. So the National Science Foundation, the Department of Commerce, the National Laboratories, things of that kind, are going to see an enormous boost in funding over the next several years. It also establishes something called regional innovation hubs, which are intended to be roughly a dozen incubator models where you will identify strategic industries, such as, for example, agriculture in the state of Indiana. Um, the One of the sponsors of the bill is the senator there on the top left, Todd Young of Indiana. 
And you know, one of the ideas behind this would be to support strategic development of, of local industries and on a regional basis with the idea of offering incentives to bring companies from other places to the United States. So a very, a very aggressive um, example of industrial policy in the United States, which is a very big shift. It's also going to establish what's called a technology directorate at the National Science Foundation, which is uh, another shift in policy from, from supporting individual investigator-driven research to trying to scale up and invest it at a much larger scale in both educational outcomes and in science and technology efforts. So think of large commercialization centers and think of efforts in the, in the STEM education arena, for example, where there are more than a dozen new programs in this bill with about $10 billion in funding attached to them of taking a robotics program and making sure every district in a given state has it, for example, instead of just the districts that can fund it themselves. So that's the idea behind this enormous investment in science and technology. It is, it's so large that it's created a me too issue, if you will, of other industries wanting similar, similar packages of support. The other piece of legislation um, that has big implications for education in the United States, and perhaps not all to the positive, is the American Rescue Plan Act, which was one of President Biden's signature initiatives early in his term. Another massive piece of fiscal stimulus, um, you know, ostensibly and largely designed around supporting COVID needs, but it had a huge, um, huge support of state governments and of education. And Basically, it totaled roughly $180 billion invested in education in the United States. And to give you an idea, that's um, roughly three, three or four years worth of federal support for education in one year. And I say it had potentially you know, mixed results is that that funding came against the backdrop now of recognition that there was also massive learning loss despite these investments. And you can imagine how that might scramble the politics of this particular issue when policymakers look at changes in education because it's 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 at least muddied the correlation between additional federal funding and outcomes in education. I suppose one can make the argument that without those investments, the outcomes would be worse. But again, that's not a very good political bumper sticker going into an election. So in conclusion, you know, one of the things that we focus on as STEM advocates is trying to make sure these big innovation laws do in fact get stood up in ways that, that realize their potential. And so we spent a lot of our time making sure that funding in years two, three, and four materialized for new education initiatives, making sure that, that policymakers in Congress and in state legislatures are, avail are aware of these things so that state governments can take advantage of them as well. The other shift that we're trying to, to engage in is that the United States business community has not been very involved in education um, across the board over the last five or 10 years. It was much more involved 20 years ago um, when, when we passed major education laws in the George W. Bush presidency. But you know, we've had debates about things like common core standards in mathematics and next generation standards in science that have been largely a turnoff to the business community because they've become very polarizing. And I think one of the things you're starting to see is this recognition that they can't hire people for their jobs, so therefore they want to engage in policy you know, to a much larger degree than they have in the past. And one thing that goes along with this is to the extent that we're going to have economic development-oriented policies in the United States, making sure they're coupled to investments and similar programs in STEM education and workforce development is really important. So for example, in the CHIPS Act at $52 billion for semiconductor manufacturing, that there's only $50 million, million dollars in that bill to engage in educational activities and workforce development around those facilities. And my guess would be five years from now, you, you would see a lot of analysis that would show there was insufficient coupling of large industrial investments with workforce development to support those facilities. And then, you know, one of the other challenges here is obviously trying to write the balance between math, reading, and science in terms of priorities. We have... We have traditionally emphasized math and reading because those are the skills that are most in need at in the early grades in our poorest schools. But it's it's pretty clear that if you don't emphasize science, you're not laying the groundwork for a lot of the, the higher level engagement in science later on that leads to careers in these fields. And basically you're not giving kids a chance to play around with lab equipment. So so you know that that's a that's something we've lost in the in the online world that I think is much more widely recognized and that 
you know, the next time we have a chance to change federal priorities, which is done by legislation and only happens about once every 10 years, you know, it's coming up in about two years. So so we're focused on trying to write that balance. And then obviously, you know, the other part of this is in our role as, as, an, as an issue area, STEM education has support from both parties and we have to maintain that. So we, when we don't see we don't when we do see changes in the political makeup of the United States, we want to make sure everybody sees this as an issue that, that everybody has a stake in. It's not just a partisan. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll leave some time for questions if we have an opportunity to do that. But let me just thank Gert and the rest of the team at the EU STEM Coalition for the opportunity. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brown, for this very interesting presentation. Unfortunately, we will uh, not have time for, for a Q&A back and forth, but I just want to highlight a few points from uh, uh, what you just presented. Uh, you spoke about the American CHIPS Act and specifically some of the education components that are um, also visible to some extent in the European CHIPS Act that you may be aware of. Uh, so I think there are some very interesting parallels between the challenges that you described and what we're currently facing here in Europe. And uh, you also spoke about this kind of s very slow moving change in the perception of STEM. And I think that's also something that we very much uh, can recognize here in, in Europe and that we definitely need to address. And that's, uh, that's a nice segue into our next, uh, next speaker, our last speaker of today, uh, which is, um, and, uh, which is, Mr. Who is uh, Mr. Martin Kern, who is the director of the European Institute for Innovation and Technology. And he will uh, give a short presentation, unfortunately not live. He had to change his travel plans last minute, so he, had, he will give his presentation as a pre-recorded video. Uh, but he will speak uh, about a very new initiative that was just announced this week by the European Commission and the EIT to address some of these challenges that were covered in the other presentations called the Deep Tech Talent Initiative, which has implications for us as STEM platforms as well. So we'll speak in the work sessions about them later on. But first, I would like to give the word to Mr. Martin Kern to uh, give us the headline, headline news about the Deep Tech Talent Initiative. Greetings from the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. I'm the director, Martin Kern, and I'm happy um, to send you this message for the General Assembly of the EU STEM Coalition and apologies for not being with you in person this week. Right now in Europe we face major challenges. The war in Ukraine, climate change, the pandemic and the ongoing energy and economic crisis are big challenges for all of us. However, what they have in common is that innovation is key for their solution and for the way forward. Um, this is why the European Commission announced a new European Innovation Agenda in July and the EIT has earlier this week launched a new scheme, the Deep Tech Talent Initiative. With this Deep Tech Talent Initiative, we want to make a difference because we believe that technologies and in particular technologies in deep tech areas are key to building the solutions for the major societal challenges that we face in Europe right now. Um, deep tech is rooted in cutting edge science, research, technology and engineering. What it has in common is that it often requires um, long science and research periods, um, heavy investments and um, deep knowledge of technologies that are underlying these, these, these uh, research areas. Um, we're speaking about artificial intelligence, machine learning, manufacturing, biotechnology, blockchain, robotics, photonics. Those technologies in itself can contribute to the solutions that we need in Europe, but in particular combining them um, often leads to the innovations and commercializations that is part of solutions for societal challenges. Um, so deep tech innovations are indispensable for Europe. And in order to have more deep tech innovations in Europe, we need more skilled people, talents that can apply them, that are knowledgeable, and that can turn those technologies into solutions as needed. 
Um, at the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, as part of the Deep Tech Talent Initiative, we want to train and skill one million people in the next three years. That is a high level of ambition, but the type of challenges we face in Europe right now do need that type of ambition to take us forward and for Europe to remain competitive. So in cooperation with the European Commission, we have launched and we were really happy that Commissioner Gabriel was at our event Innovate earlier this week to launch the pledge together with our chair of the governing board, Nektarios Tavenarakis, in order to make this program a reality. The EIT has set it up to get going immediately because we cannot lose any time. So this initiative is open to all training providers and will benefit all European talents across the continent. That includes school pupils, university students, professionals, entrepreneurs and all levels of businesses, tech industry, startups and employees at those companies. The Deep Tech Talent Initiative will also have a particular focus on supporting women to develop deep tech skills and provide incentives for them to participate in, in skill programs, in schools, in universities and in, 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 in companies. In particular, we also want to have very prominent participation of this program in countries and regions with lower innovation capacity. This will not only boost women entrepreneurship, but will also strengthen and diversify Europe's ability to innovate. The European Union needs more talent in the deep tech fields and has to maintain like that a leading position in emerging and high growth sectors, such as semiconductors, aerospace, or even quantum computing. So also new technologies that are emerging and that in the future can bring us um, solutions for challenges that we face already today. We believe that those technologies that exist very often are already available to solve the challenges that we have. But we must um, scale them up and we must apply them more widely in commercial applications. And this is where the European Institute of Innovation and Technology is very well placed to take up this challenge. Because we already have set up in the last years Europe's largest innovation ecosystem. We now have nine knowledge and innovation communities that tackle the big societal challenges and more than 3,400 partners working together across 70 hubs. <clears throat> we are the only initiative of innovation in Europe that is on the ground in all the member states. So we have a strong platform to build upon. What concerns schools, the EIT already has successful programs such as the program Girls Go Circular, which has initially been set up under our regional innovation scheme for countries in Central, Eastern and Southern Europe, but will now also as part of the new European innovation agenda be scaled up into all the member states. That means any school in Europe, any school in the European Union can participate in this program in the coming years. We have also translated this program into Ukrainian so that those displaced from Ukraine in the schools can benefit from that program here or participate in Ukraine itself. The EIT has cooperated with the EU STEM coalition successfully since several years. All We have been partners, we have been working together in our programs, we have promoted each other's events and we have tried to give each other's activities visibility. Now is the moment to take this one step further and join forces to make the initiatives that we have and the aims that we have with our joint objectives um, bring them forward together and work together. This is why as part of our pledge for the Deep Tech Talent Initiative, we would like the EU STEM coalition either as a whole or via the individual national platforms to come on board to join forces and to jointly solve the challenges that we have in the skills area in Europe. We think your network is ideally placed to become part of the Deep Tech Talent Initiative and we're very happy to hear that you will discuss this issue in your meetings this week and at the EIT we look forward to hear the outcome of your discussions. We invite all European stakeholders, not just the EU STEM coalition, but all stakeholders from education, 
education providers, training providers, employees, businesses, business associations, financing partners, and also public stakeholders in the member states to think about joining the Deep Tech Talent Initiative, because only through a wide cooperation across Europe then can we solve the challenges that we have and we can reach the type of ambition to have much more um, students, much more school kids, much more women in STEM, but also in deep tech talent area. I look forward to hear from you. Please contact us at the EIT if you want to be part of the initiative. Myself and my colleagues are available for that. And our website is up and running since Tuesday, the www.eitdeeptechtalent.eu. Have a great assembly. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Kern. Uh, more info, as already mentioned, can be found on the brand new uh, Deep Tech Talent Initiative website, and we will share the link to that also in the meeting documents. And we will, of course, uh, cover this new initiative in our work sessions later on. So that brings us to the end of the first part of our program. Uh, before we close the session, I would like to thank all of you for joining us here today, uh, as well as those who have joined us today online. Uh, thank you for, for being there. If you'd like to see back any of the presentations or, um, or learn more about the topics that we discussed, uh, you'll find all of them very soon uh, in the meeting report on the EU STEM Coalition website. So thank you for being with us, and we're looking forward to seeing you again at the next meeting. Thank you. Just a, a small practical remark. Uh, we'll have a coffee break right now uh, because we're running a little bit over time. So I suggest that we meet uh, around four, uh, for, so that's about in 15 minutes. Uh, for the work sessions, or those at least uh, who participate in that, which will take place in the room behind the, the coffee area, so we can meet up there. And maybe also interesting to know that at the moment there are all kinds of student activities with robotics going on in the areas around the coffee area, so if you would like to see how it's done in, in France with the, the robotics training of the young children, feel free to just pop into the rooms, so you're very welcome to, uh, to take a look. Yeah.